Welcome to those who are going to join us. It's Wednesday, May the 13th, Mountain Daylight Time. We're going through the second chapter, first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the Govinda Dev. Good morning. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Om Aganati Maranda Sanganangana Sarakya Chaksurun Miritam Yana Tajmai Sri Gurve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapitam Yana Bhutare Sayam Rupakaramayam Dharati Sapanatikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamaram Sri Guru and Vaishnavam Sya Sri Rupam Sagatam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Ladita Shri Vishakan Vitamstha Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shri Madhi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tanamani Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pachari Nevishes Sonyodhi Paskada De Sadhari Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari Govinda Dev Joe Jimmy, you, you have to type Hare Krishna. That, that, I'm missing that Hare Krishna comment there first thing in the morning. Anjali, thanks all of you for joining on Wednesday. And Anjali typed Hare Krishna. There we are. Thank you, Jimmy. Now we can start the morning in the proper way. You've said Hare Krishna. <laughs> uh, it's Wednesday, May 13th, <clears throat> Mountain Daylight Time. And uh, I have some bad news for you. We're, I've got more to say on the 10th verse in the second chapter, first canto. We have not yet exhausted all the points that this verse evokes. And so I don't even know if we're going to get to the 11th verse, which is Vedanti Tat Tad Bhavam. Chris, good morning. Um, but we'll see, we'll, we'll continue now because there's just so much nectar in this kamasyanandriyapatiya labo jiva jiva shata vidyana sha nartu es cha kama vihi we've spent Monday discussing this verse Tuesday discussing this verse and I thought we would finish it yesterday but we got so much deep into it that there's still more points that I'd like to bring up in connection with this verse and if we finish a little early uh, we'll move on then to the to the eleventh verse, which is that the absolute truth is manifested in three different phases. But in the meantime, this is these are the comments in Prabhupada's purport to the tenth verse that uh, make me want to take one more day. Mitravinda, welcome to join us. Mala, welcome. Please have my obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada and good morning. <laughs> So these are Prabhupada's comments that made me want to say just a little bit more, spend one more day or part of a day on this 10th uh, verse, second chapter, first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Seekers of the absolute truth are never allured by unnecessary arrangements and sense gratification because the serious students seeking the absolute truth are always overwhelmed with the work of researching the truth. This is what excited me. I'll repeat this. Serious students seeking the absolute truth are always overwhelmed with the work of researching the truth. In every sphere of life, therefore, the ultimate end must be seeking after the absolute truth, and that sort of engagement will make one happy because he will be less engaged in varieties of sense gratification. So one of the most compelling reasons is that devotees of the Lord uh, can wean themselves from excessive sense gratification, from dependence upon sense gratification is by virtue of the simple fact that there are so many services that you can do in the context of bhakti yoga. There just, there's unlimited services. The whole world could be engaged in serving Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's mission, Lord Krishna's temples, uh, or putting on festivals. There's no limit to it. 24 hours in a day, seven days a week is just not enough. Sometimes I laugh or I joke with people. When we chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Rama, Hare Hare. The, the, the purport of this prayer, people say, well, do you pray? We don't pray for stuff. We don't pray for sense gratification. We don't pray for a big house. We don't pray for a prestigious car. But we pray for service. We say, Lord, please uh, 
give me some service, engage me according to my talents and propensities and interests in loving you and honoring you and in spreading your glories. But sometimes I'll say to people, you know, when I say, when I chant Hare Krishna, I'm saying, oh Lord, oh energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. But then every once in a while I say, Lord, okay, that's enough. That's, that's, you know, I did. <laughs> I, I, I've got my, my plates full. I've got enough service. I saw a comment on the internet a few weeks ago. Someone said, obviously tongue in cheek, said, never before in the history of the world have you had the opportunity to save the human race by sitting in front of the TV all day. So let's not blow this. Well, I hope, I hope that that's not what you're doing. I hope you're not zoning out on next Netflix during this time. Because personally speaking, being a devotee, engaged in devotional service, and not being dependent upon the whole elaborate infrastructure which promotes sense gratification, I have never been more busy. And I can also speak for the eight or so other residents of our ashram here in Spanish Fork. We have never, in fact, been more busy than we are right here during this pandemic so-called lockdown. We have gotten into our gardening and, like never before. Before we had festivals in California and here and a lot of different things going on, different distractions. Without those distractions, we have absorbed ourselves in the gardening. It was about an acre under cultivation here and ourselves and the volunteers, we've been tilling, creating furrows, growing um, from seeds. We've made seedlings in our greenhouse. They've all been planted recently. There's ground cloth that's been pinned down protected from the wind, uprooting it. Um, we've siphoned the pond water. We have a 200,000 gallon lake with uh, koi in it. And the best fertilizer is fecal matter from fish. This is scientifically proven. And the, the, the pond, we didn't actually, we can't give ourselves credit that we thought all this out beforehand. But it just so happened that when we built the temple in Spanish Fork, the, because we're not, we don't have access to city water, we are on well water. So the zoning department, the building department required that we have a reservoir of 200,000 gallons of water right here on the property with a fire hydrant in case of fire. Of course, the temple is not built of any combustible materials. But nevertheless, we built this lake. And just as a, an aside, we rented a big bulldozer from United Rentals. And uh, by Bobby and I had a good time, you know, gouging out this. Uh, uh, hole in, in which eventually uh, 200,000 gallons of water would be contained. And then we stocked it with koi. And it just happens, just, we didn't plan it, but Krishna knows what he's doing. He sees the solution before we even see the problem. Guess what? That lake is on the highest part of the property. Booyah! That means all we have to do is siphon, put a hose into the lake, siphon it, and to our two gardens, comprising an acre all together, we get lake water, which is fertilized by fish feces. And this is going to give us crops like you've never seen before. Last three years, we've had bumper crops just using well water. But this year, and it took us about two hours every day to water an acre. This year, it takes us 15 minutes to uh, siphon the water into the upper garden and 15 minutes to... So half an hour for, to irrigate a whole acre of land with uh, this ideal um, water slash fertilizer. So we're not only completely busy, but we're so excited about growing our own food this year and expecting crops like we've never had before, different kinds of melon, different kinds of peppers, uh, zucchini, um, tomatoes, you name it, uh, eggplant, cucumbers, and not only that, we have our deity worship to maintain. Before I give class, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as I arrive early, I make an offering plate to the deity. I offer it. I do the Mongol Arti. I do the Tulsi Arti. And then I come and sit here and give class for you. Then we do, do the gardening. And uh, there's just so much to do, even during this lockdown. And the reason that we're not saving the world by watching TV all day long is because... <laughs> The Krishna conscious or bhakti lifestyle frees you from dependence upon all 
the infrastructure that's required in order to bring sense gratification to one's door. Imagine even if you're watching TV or Netflix, imagine all the infrastructure that's required to bring that to your television screen so you could just become dumber during the epidemic. So that means you're dependent upon this imp same imp for your recreation. You're dependent on all this uh, recreational material, all this pop, so you can further degrade your brain. But Krishna conscious, we're not dependent. I'm, of course, I'm taking advantage of the internet to go online six times a week, and I'm relishing being able to associate with people like yourself, which are, who are as far away as Minnesota, Jimmy and Teresa. <laughs> But without this, I, I would still be doing the same thing. I would still be preaching, we'd still be gardening, we'd still be worshiping the deity, still be cooking. Um, Krishna consciousness is not dependent upon any external arrangement. We <laughs> cited the verse a few days ago, Shravid Varishtakari Samstuta Pashya Pashu Naya Karnapatopita Jatu Nama Gurnagraja In connection with attached politicians who cling to their positions, to the very end of life, even after they've had three strokes, as it happened with, I forget if it was Nehru or Radhakrishna, um, says people who are like dogs, hogs, camels, and asses elect bigger people who are like dogs, hogs, camels, and asses to lead them. And so one, one reference here is to doggish life. And we see that the result of modern education, and nowadays, practically speaking, you can't even get a job with a BA. You've got to have to... Uh, you got to have a master's or a PhD or at least an MBA to get a decent job, okay? But what if you're laid off? What if there's a little uh, virus going around the world and the economy has suffered a hit and your company lays you off? With all that education and the student loans and everything goes with it, plus the fact that you're, you're in your late 20s already, you're, you're past your prime by the time you get your certificates, which make you eligible then to go around and look for a job. What's the most common complaint we hear nowadays? People are out of work. 30 million people are out of work. Well, if you had a little bit of land and a garden and a cow, you would not be complaining that you're out of work. And if you had a simple house with which is suitable for the needs of your family and simple transport, you would not be head over heels in debt. You would not be enslaved and bound to lenders. You would not be complaining, practically speaking, about any of the current conditions. I saw, that's right, it was a, a rebroadcast of an NBC News clip from a few years ago. It was a family that had a suburban house just the normal strips of lawn by the driveway and a little backyard. And this was an extended family. It was, a, you know, not only the, the family, but the cousins and all. And they lived like 10, 12 people in this suburban house. I forget what city it was. And they grew all their food right there in suburbia. They had a watering system coming from the roof. They had... Uh, uh, they had uh, potted plants on the terraces. There wasn't a square inch of, of uh, uh, earth that was just used for grass. It was all planted and cultivated. And they're right here. They're in suburbia, what to speak of having rural land. And they're all down on their knees, tilling and gardening, laughing and enjoying each other's close association. The next clip showed them at the dinner table with overflowing with fresh fruits and vegetables, just laughing and having the time of their life. So if you, if you had little land and a cow, would you be saying, I'm out of work, I can't pay my bills, I'm going down for the third time? It is only because we have diverted from the main business of the human form of life, which is to pursue the absolute truth, and in concurrence with that, live a simple life, free from indebtedness, and be close to our family and friends and relatives, and be in independent. That independence is something we should put much more value on. We should cling to it. We should guard it. Uh, we should be jealous of our independence. Here in Spanish Fork, we're, we're bill-free. We're mortgage-free. 
we grow as much of our fruits and vegetables as we can, considering the climate. And uh, we're busy. We're busier now than we've ever been before. And look at the result of modern education. To be, once you get your degree, your MBA, then just like a dog, a dog needs a good master. A dog cannot survive on its own. A dog is never independent. Independence is bad for a dog. You see a dog that's independent, he's all skinny, his ribs are showing, he's got scurvy, he's scared, his tail's between the leg, he's terrified of everybody and everything. On the other hand, you see a dog that has a good master, he's got to, you know, he's got to, he's a little overweight, his coat is shining, and uh, he's got a good robust woof, woof. So he must be dependent. He cannot survive independence. His whole training, his body itself, the species that he's in, dictates that he's better off being dependent and not independent. So what is the result of years and years and years, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of tuition fees, you just get someone spewed out of the educational system who has no idea of the real purpose of human life, no interest in pursuing God consciousness, no latitude to pursue God consciousness, because by then you're, you're committed, you're enslaved with student loans and all that you've invested in it. You can hardly even spare any time at all for pursuing the real purpose of the human form of life. And I'm sorry if this is very plain speaking, but modern education just creates dogs in that sense that they have to go around. Can you give me a job, sir? Can you give me a job, sir? Can you give me a job, sir? And if you don't get a position, if you don't get dependence with some corporation or some entity, then you have no means of, you don't, you don't know what to do with yourself. You don't know how to feed yourself. You don't know how to, you don't know how to uh, how, uh, recreate. You don't know how to make a pers purposeful, meaningful life. Uh, this is the result of modern education. Prophet once referred to it as a slaughterhouse because it's not equipping us with the skills that we need to capitalize on the rare and valuable opportunity of this human form of life, make it successful, at the end of life, go back home, back to Godhead. Prabhupada told a story one time, the Himalayan mountains started rumbling. <clears throat> and it appeared as if these majestic, highest mountain ranges in the world, extending over 1,500 miles in several states, it seemed as if the Himalayan mountains were going to give birth, and everybody's expectation was that such a grand landscape will give birth to something amazing and wonderful. And so the population um, south of the Himalayas and north of the Limitations, such as it was, according to this narration, they all gathered in audience as spectators to see what magnificent, glorious, wondrous, uh, thing would be produced from the Himalayan mountains and the mountains roared and roared and roared and rumbled and things seemed to be reaching a crescendo and a climax and finally the Himalayan mountains give birth and what should come out of the Himalayan mountains but a bunch of rats. You know, big elaborate arrangement. Look at all the universities and all the endowments, all the buildings and all the professorships and all the research facilities. All that goes into it and what does it produce? People who go through the system and have no independence. They're completely dependent upon and tied into the infrastructure which is meant to promote sense gratification. And you will look in vain, not only in the university and collegial level, but the high school and the private. You will search in vain for a single mention, I think it's even illegal, of the absolute truth. There's no course designed to teach us about God or about the soul. So, hence the story about the Himalayas producing so much arrangement just in order to make people dependent. On the other hand, in the Bhagavad Gita, ninth chapter, second verse, Krishna says, Raja Vidya, Raja Gayam, Povitam, Idam Uttamam, Pachaksava Gavanam Dharmam, Susukam Kartamabhyam. This knowledge of Krishna, of Bhagavan, of the absolute truth from which everything comes, is the king of all knowledge. There are different types of knowledge, just like there are different types of edifices. 
different types of residences. The most humble type of residence is just a straw thatched hut, which may even be seasonal. Then you get something with clay or adobe and something with mortar and then brick and then bigger and bigger up to the palatial, up to the parliament hall, up to the state capitol. And then you have the king, the king, you have the, the, like I said, you have the palace of the king, you have the White House, you have the presidential palace. And that's of all the different levels and categories of architecture, the residence of the king or the prime minister is considered to be the king, the, the, the most grand. So similarly, there is knowledge and then there's knowledge. So knowledge about how to feed yourself, how to clothe yourself, how to transport yourself, how to harness some of God's elemental energies so you can have shelter, so you can have food, so you can have transport, so you can have uh, energy, you can have light. Those are basic levels of knowledge, just like the simple thatched hut or the adobe hut. But knowledge itself has higher and higher and higher levels, and the king of knowledge is to know the absolute truth. Why is that the king of knowledge? Povitam idam utamam. It's beyond, it's independent of, and transcendental to this tamaha, this dark material world. Krishna says, the world from which this knowledge comes is not dependent upon sunlight or moonlight or electricity. Natad bhayasi tu sharam na shashanka na pavaka yadgat bhana devartate taddama paramamamaha. That world from which this knowledge comes, that kingdom of God, has its own effulgence. It's not dark by nature and then artificially illuminated by sun and moon and electricity. It is the self-effulgent spiritual world. Vyaktam vyaktam ap, vyaktam vyaktam, vyaktatsara itu tush, tamahum paramam, yad prapya narvartate, taddama paramamara. And what is that world? That when all this world, when all this material world is annihilated in due course of time, that world remains as it is. This world, Bhutpa Bhutpa Pali, comes and goes through periods of manifestation, creation, manifestation, and then retraction or annihilation. But that world stays eternally the same, that self-effulgent world. And that is a world from which knowledge of the absolute truth springs. And it's not just a matter of faith, belief, or dogma. It says, pratyaksa bhagamam dharmam. It can be directly experienced, provided the context, provided the nourishment, provided the education is there. Pratyaksa bhagamam dharmam susukam kartamabhyam. And it is blissful and joyfully performed. So considering all the assets of the absolute truth, connecting to it and pursuing the absolute truth, why would anybody waste their life for temporary benefits of a materialistic society? Simply because they don't know any better. They haven't had the exposure, the opportunity, the education. That's why Prabhupada said, modern educational system is more or less like a slaughterhouse. You're born and then you, have no, you get no tools about how you can continue to live forever. Normally, as I said, jatasya hi dhruva mitir, dhruva janman mitasya, tajmara puriyat natum toshita marasi. For one who is born, death is certain. Yeah, that's, a, that's a given. For one who is born, death is certain. Every graveyard, every tombstone has a date of birth and a date of death. You won't go to any graveyard, cemetery, anywhere in the world, and there'll be a date of birth and no date of death. So everyone who's born will die. But then it's also true that those who are not awakened in transcendental consciousness, once they die, they're going to be reborn again over and over and over and over and over again. So what is the ultimate use of an educational system which does not teach you how at, at, at the end of this life, upon leaving this current body, teach you how not to have to come back and take another body again. Otherwise, what's the use? Your bank balance, your house in the suburb, your BMW motor car, what's the use? You work so hard in order to get it, you invest so much of your time and energy, so much money, and you get it, and then after enjoying it for a short 20 or 30 years, 
you drop dead of a heart attack because stress and anxiety, high cholesterol, and yada, 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 or you die of the coronavirus, and then you have to start all over again. What is the sense in that kind of a lifestyle? So therefore, it's said here in Bhagavad Gita, this knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge, and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and joyfully performed. And just earlier here in the Bhagavatam, Krishna said, or I think it was maybe, I'm not sure who said this, evam prashana manasho bhagavad bhakti yoga taha. When one's heart is cleared of all nonsense. I mean, we have to make concessions for subsistence. But, but a, you know, an acre of land and a cow it pretty much does the job. You, know, you don't have to have an, a degree from IIT or Harvard in order to subsist. You see, or, uh, most companies nowadays don't even require a college education. They'll just take you and train you. Um, so it says that, when one's heart is cleared of all nonsense, then one can understand what God is. Thus, the process of devotional service of Krishna consciousness is the king of all education, the king of all confidential knowledge. It is the purest form of religion that it can be executed joyfully without difficulty. Therefore, one should adopt it. Normally, before the lockdown, I was very busy doing um, seven or nine festival of colors in three different states throughout the whole year, so permitting arranging for transportation and B&Bs for the artists, doing the social media, uh, lining up the toilets and the, the uh, dumpsters and all. Pretty much like, kept me really, really busy in management most of the time. That all evaporated sometime around the second week of March. <laughs> and we don't think that it, we're gonna get back to it probably any time this year. We nominally have a festival scheduled on June 13th in Salt Lake City, another one on June 20th in Ogden, and another one on June 27th in San Fernando Valley. And those were all pushed back. Those were all dates pushed back, rescheduled from an earlier date. Um, but I'm not very hopeful that any of those will take place as scheduled. We may push them back to the fall, but to be honest with you, I don't even know if we'll get back to mass gatherings even in the fall. And then we we'll hope that there's not a resurgence of the pandemic so that then spring events next year are not canceled. But anyway, be that as it may, my point is that having not had to do management for the last six weeks, I have the opportunity to go online and monitor some of the preachers that are out there on, from ISKCON. And it's unbelievable, it's staggering, the number of great preachers and the quality and quantity of their knowledge, it's unbelievable. Goranga, for instance. Uh, I never had time to listen to Goranga Das's talks before. The man is so knowledgeable, and he knows verses that uh, I never even heard of the books, what to speak of the verses he knows. And so deliberate and logical, and so convincing. You get a chance, listen to Goranga Das uh, on YouTube. Madhavananda, <laughs> we were doing the Festival of India in Southern California in 80 and 81. And it was just like now, just like the Festival of Colors, we do it in multi-states. So we were based in Los Angeles. And uh, the GBC allotted some money for exhibits and some trucks. And their idea was that we would do the Rathiatras. We would support the Temple Rathiatras during the summer months with some exhibits and a stage. So I thought, well, we've got all this equipment. Why don't we take it to colleges as well? Why should we be idle the other nine months of the year? Why should we just do six or eight Rathiatras and have this stuff warehoused the rest of the year? So I went to the local authority there, Ramashrani, and said, look, if we put in the time, the energy, and the planning, can we parley this festival program, these exhibits, to do college events, Festival of India? And uh, it got so big and so popular that we even went as far away as uh, Oregon and Arizona. We didn't limit ourselves to Southern California. We did about 100 colleges, USC, UCLA, Golden West College, Occidental College. There wasn't any college that refused us. So I remember we were in University of Arizona. It was on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. 
Uh, we had a, 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 a boutique to sell yoga, yoga pants and kurtas and all. And we also served a meal right in the quad there. And we charged for the meal, we charged for the boutique, otherwise we offered the festival free of charge. And this guy came up, he wasn't a student there, and, uh, and he, he just kind of seemed interested and attracted. And he kind of hung out and helped us out for two days. So at the end of the second day, Wednesday night, we packed up all the tents and the exhibits in the truck, and we're getting ready to go to the next college or the next location. He says, I want to become a devotee. So he just got into the truck. And he, 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 that is Madhavananda. And he spent the last 20 years in Jagannath Puri on the east coast of India in Orissa. He got initiated, I think, by Gorgovinda Maharaj. And I got the chance to listen to some of his talks during this lockdown. And absolutely amazing. And there's an extra uh, relish in there for me because he became a devotee through the program that we had going in 1981 in Southern California. So there is so much. You can't even come to the end of it. Sundari Priya is on the call with us now. She says she just goes from one talk to another. Zoom, Facebook Live, whatever and whatever. Just put in Hare Krishna lectures, Hare Krishna sermons, and you'll be off and running. Honestly, you'll hardly have time to eat or sleep. There's so much out there. So many knowledgeable, intelligent, and, and eloquent speakers who are pregnant with knowledge about the bhakti cult and the bhakti tradition. No wonder Narada Muni here says in this uh, section of the Bhagavatam, Please, therefore, now this is Sanaka speaking to Sudha Goswami, please, therefore, describe the almighty Lord's activities which you have learned by your vast knowledge of the Vedas. So here's Sutta Goswami, who's fully conversant in all Vedic literatures, and he also knows Vedanta, he also knows the purpose of the Vedas, which is undivided devotion to the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. And this great, eloquent, not only speaker, he not only knows precept, but he follows by example. He approaches the assembled sages in Namasharanya, and they are so excited. They're sitting on the edge of their seats. They can't wait for the Ganges nectarine flow of Krishna Kata to come out of his mouth. And so therefore, vibrating with scintillating expectation and excitement, they say, Sutta Goswami, please describe the Almighty Lord's activities which you have learned by your vast knowledge of the Vedas, for that will satisfy the hankerings of great learned men and at the same time mitigate the miseries of the masses of common people who are always suffering from material pangs. Indeed, there is no other way to get out of such miseries. This is the king of education. This is the fruit of all knowledge and all learning. There's no end to it. It's unlimited. It's like an ocean that you jump into. And there's no borders. There's no beaches. There's no end in sight. There is a nice story in this connection in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, had his school of grammar there in Navadvip. And uh, passing through the area was a great scholar named Keshav Kazmiri. He was a scholar and a poet. He had been particularly blessed by the demigoddess Saraswati, the goddess of learning. He traveled all over India with a lot of followers. Some accounts say that he rode on an elephant like a Digvijaya, a conquering pundit. And uh, he just happened to be passing the Ganges River there one afternoon where Lord Chaitanya was bathing with some of his students. And one thing led to another. And uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu invited Kesha of Kashmiri to compose uh, a poem about the Ganges River just right there on the spot. And accepting that request, the Kashmiri, he, 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 he just... Uh, composing it right on the spot, right off the top of his head, he composed and recited no less than 100 verses in praise of the Mother Ganges. And then he asked Lord Chaitanya, he said, isn't that the greatest thing you ever heard? He was puffed up because of his being patronized by Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. He thought, there's no one more learned than me, there's no one more fortunate than me. And so he, he, expecting Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would kowtow to him 
and flatter him and become another one of his sycophants, he said with a condescending attitude to this teacher of grammar who wouldn't know anything about poetry and composition. He's just sort of a mechanic. Grammar, grammar, grammarians, he saw them as just mechanics. So, he's, so he, he said, what do you think of this composition? And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, he said, of course there are unlimited faults. Um, but if you like, I can give you five literary embellishments and five faults. That was the last thing that the occasion of Kashmir expected. <laughs> he was so full of mundane knowledge, he was unaware that there's a whole level of transcendental knowledge. And so then, and, and Lord Chaitanya had picked one verse, he, I think it was the 64th verse. And the first question that Keshav uh, uh, asked is, how, how, did you, how did you remember the 64th out of 100 verses? This, this is the, the verse itself. Mahatpam gangaya satatam idam abhati nitaram yad esha shri vishnu charana kamala pati shubhanka dvitiya shri lakshmir iva shara nara acha charana bhavani vatur ya shereshavi bhavati adbhuta guna. A translation. The greatness of Mother Ganges always brilliantly exists. She is the most fortunate because she emanated from the lotus feet of Lord Sri Vishnu, the personality of Godhead. She is a second goddess of fortune, and therefore she is always worshipped both by the demigods and humanity, endowed with all wonderful qualities. She flourishes on the head of Lord Shiva. And when Lord Chaitanya recited that word for word, he was astonished. He said, how did you remember that? And Lord Chaitanya said, my memory, as well as your composing power, are by the grace of the Lord. He starts to teach him that whatever powers we have are not derived from our own intellectual acuity or from the demigods like Mother Saraswati. Ultimately, if you trace it back, every power, physical, mental, intellectual, spiritual, comes from Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. Just like when Harani Kashyapu asked Prahlad Maharaj, where does your power come from? Prahlad said, My power comes from the same place that everybody's power comes from. My power comes from the place that your power comes from, that his power comes from, that her power comes from. The source of all powers is one. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is teaching the case of Kashmiri that he shouldn't think of himself as independently powerful, as independently brilliant, as independently intellectual. Neither should he think that his gift to be able to compose like the wind comes from Mother Saraswati. It ultimately comes from Krishna. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, actually anybody who worships any other entity, including the demigods, really was worshiping me, they do it without proper knowledge. And in fact, the worship of anyone other than Krishna, what to speak of the worship of oneself, is described as a bidi purvakam. It is, in a sense, it is illegal. Right here, Prabhupada says here, persons who are engaged in the worship of demigods are not very intelligent, although such worship is offered to me indirectly. For example, when a man pours water on the leaves and branches of a tree without pouring water on the root, he does so without sufficient knowledge. So this is a difference in case of Kashmir and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya, is, he's Krishna, but in his role as a human being, he's plugged into the unlimited knowledge of Krishna, and he accesses that not just by intellectual study and practice, but by devotion, by acts of devotion and surrender, Krishna blesses him, showers him with more and more creativity, more and more wisdom, more and more knowledge. Whereas if one is simply accumulating knowledge for one's own self-aggrandizement, there are serious limits to what one can achieve. Over and above that, if your talent, if your intellectual talent is given to you by Krishna and you don't use it to acknowledge and to honor Krishna, it's going to dry up. It's not going to last. 
It's going to be withdrawn from you because you're not recognizing the source from which it comes. So continuing on here with this purport, the demigods are, so to speak, different officers and directors in the government of the Supreme Lord. One has to follow the laws by the government, not the officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to automatically satisfy... Okay, wait a minute. Everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only. In other words, if you follow the president, if you follow the executive, then all the lesser officers will automatically be satisfied. But if you try to bypass the president or the executive and try to follow one of the officers, that is a bidi purvaka. That is, in a sense, illicit. It's like if the police officer pulls you over because you've been speeding, and as he's writing a ticket, you offer him a bribe instead. You want to deal with him rather than take the ticket and pay your fine to the government. That in itself is a separate crime besides the fact that you were speeding in the first place. So Prabhupada emphasized that point. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government and to offer some bribe to the officers and directors illegal. This is stated here as a bidi porvakam. In other words, Krishna has not approved the unnecessary worship of the demigods. In Chaitanya Charamrita, it's stated, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Dai Kara Vichara, Vichara Karate Chide Pabecha Matkara. If you are indeed gifted intellectually, if you're interested in logic and argument, our request is to please apply it. Krishna Das Kavaraj requests you, please apply your talent in that regard to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If you do so, you will find it to be chamatkara, strikingly wonderful. You'll find it to be totally amazing. And to finish up here and give you the conclusion of this story of the encounter between Kesav Kashmir and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Chaitanya went on to describe the five faults in his composed verse. He also described the five literary embellishments. He said there are many, many more faults, but I just wanted to mention a few of them. Kejab Kazmiri was devastated. He thought that Saraswati no longer liked him. He thought that Saraswati had withdrawn her patronage from him. So he went home that night, and in a dream, Saraswati appeared before him. And she said, not only have I not withdrawn my patronage from you, but coming into contact with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and being exposed to the vast expansion, expanse and horizon of bhakti knowledge, bhakti literature, bhakti devotion, bhakti intellect. Now you're ready to graduate to the next level. I have nothing more to teach you. I have nothing more to give you. You simply now have to surrender to the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then your pursuit of knowledge, your intellectualism, will not only bear fruit, but turning those talents and abilities from now on to glorify and honor the Supreme Lord from whom all knowledge, from whom all wisdom, from whom all love, from whom all deep relationships, all meaning and purposeful comes. Now the Lord being pleased upon you because you reached a, a brick wall when you met the logician, the grammarian, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You had gone as far as you could go on the path of mental speculation and intellectual pursuit. But now I want you to go tomorrow morning and lay down like a stick, offer your dandavats, prostrate yourself at the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then you will cross over into the unlimited ocean of the nectar of devotion and your life will be completely successful. And you think you were busy before in intellectual pursuits and intellectual activities, forget about it. Once you surrender to the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you'll be so busy. There'll be so many things to research in the nature of the absolute truth that 24 hours a day will not be enough. Seven days a week will not be enough. You'll be full, you'll be excited, you'll be uh, totally engaged, and you'll have no time. Sense gratification will just go out the window. It'll be unnecessary, useless, and irrelevant to the new life that you found, the new birth that you found in the service of Lord Sri Krishna and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Namo Brahmanya Devaya, Namo Mahabharanaya Krishna Prema Vidayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gord Svena Maha. The International Society for Krishna Consciousness, 
which is composed of 800 temples all over the world. Hundreds and thousands of gardeners, mechanics, poets, flower garlanders, artists, actors, speakers, management, managers, businessmen, and the jewels amongst them, the, the intellectuals, the wonderfully realized and articulate speakers who are everywhere, everywhere you turn now on the internet, you cannot avoid the nectar dripping from the mouths of so many different surrendered, practicing Debhakti yogis. This is all due to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And if you consider, like Krishnadas Kavaraj says, the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from the point of view of an intellectual, from the point of view of logic and argument, chamatkara, you will be amazed, your mouth will drop open, your hair will stand on head. So please, please don't waste this downtime watching Netflix. Go instead and begin to taste and to drink the nectar which flows like the Ganges from the lotus mouth of the bhakti yogas, the devotees of the Lord. That is our humble request on this Wednesday morning, May the 13th, 2020. And that concludes our Bhagavatam classes for this week. We'll be back, we spent three whole days on one verse, so we'll be back next Monday with the 11th verse, Vedanti tat tat bam viras tat bam yam brahmiti paramatiti bhagavanditi sabdhite discussion of the absolute truth in three aspects, Bhagavan, Paramatma, and Brahman. In the meantime, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.